over five months, Samira has been waiting, waiting for her daughter Nora to come home from Syria to Brussels. Samira is Belgian. This divorced mother of four said she had no idea her daughter wanted to leave. A normal girl. She took some religion classes, she did her prayers. She was a completely normal girl. She had her friends. I didn't notice anything. And I think all the parents were the same because they led a normal life. Although her daughter became progressively more religious, Samira said there were no warning bells. Shortly after her 18th birthday, Nora quit school. She just turned 18, and I said, listen, you need a diploma, it's your last year of school. But she said, no, I don't feel right, I want to quit school. I'll go and sign up at the employment agency. I want to do something, being able to wear my headscarf. I said, all right, OK, as long as we have food in the house. And she quit school, and she started taking more religion courses to deepen her faith. And after several months, she left. Nora left for Syria in May, where she married a fellow Belgian from her hometown. Her husband was killed three weeks later, but Nora has not come home. Nora is one of the estimated 300 young Belgian Muslims who's gone to Syria to help. And they're not alone. From Sweden to France to the UK or Denmark, there's said to be some 2,000 young European Muslims helping or fighting in a war European governments warn is not theirs to fight. And now there's a growing concern that the real threat is when these so-called foreign fighters come home, exporting this radicalization back to Europe. Dimitri Bontik went to Syria to find his 18-year-old son Jehoen, but he came back alone. He's now written a book about his son's ordeal. Bontek says Jehoan went to Jesuit schools and neither he nor his ex-wife Jehoan's mother were religious. But at 15 he converted to Islam after falling in love with a Muslim girl. He became increasingly religious. Bontek says to call his son or other young Belgians a European security threat is ridiculous. He blames the Belgian government for stigmatizing them. Uh, I've been in Syria. Am I radicalized? No. Am I traumatic? No. All these journalists from the old world press, who is going to Syria? When they come back from Syria, are they traumatized? No. Where is the proof that they fight there? Who said that they are not youngsters uh, working as a volunteer in a clinic on medical point? And why they do so? Because they fail. Because they don't have laws, they don't make it forbidden that radical organizations are active here in this country. This is the truth. Nobody of these politicians, they ask the reason why, why youngsters are going to Syria. This is the point. Why? This question has been part of a national soul-searching over the past six months, a soul-searching which has intensified since the number of young Belgians killed in Syria has increased. And also a national awakening when per capita, Belgium is the European country with the largest number of foreign fighters in Syria. But for Belgium's interior minister who created a task force to tackle this problem, criticism of government inertia is unfair. Not doing enough? I think we're doing the maximum. I think that at European level we've even become a point of reference regarding everything we've put in place. We've set up a whole strategy of fighting and preventing radicalization. We've strengthened our services, added more means. We have a thorough follow-up. But of course, you can never prevent a young person from leaving his parents. We can't put a police officer at each door. Every Saturday, Jean-Louis Denis collects food to distribute to the poor and homeless. A Muslim convert, Jean-Louis says it's his spiritual duty to fight an unjust system of capitalism and democracy. He's an ex-member of Sharia for Belgium, which was allegedly dissolved after its leader was sentenced to prison for incitement to hatred. It's also been accused of recruiting young Belgian Muslims for Syria. And while Jean-Louis is open about wanting Sharia law introduced in Belgium, he denies his group preyed on young people who were lost or vulnerable. They helped me with the poor. They wanted to change this corrupt capitalist system, this unjust and perverted democracy. They really had a thirst for idealism. 
And for those parents, these mothers who are saying he was recruited, he was indoctrinated, he was brainwashed, they should be asking themselves, what did they do to their children? Because they're the ones who wanted to brainwash their children, turn them into democratic Muslims, secular Muslims. If tomorrow your son could go to work for the Belgian army and earn 2,000 euros a month, would you like for him to join the Belgian army? And they would say, yes, that would be good, even if he's ready to die for the Belgian army for this money, this toilet paper money of 2,000 euros, and so for money they're ready to hand over their son to the Belgians, but when it's for Allah and to restore Sharia, you say they've been recruited. Chantal is not her real name and she asks that we don't show her face. Not because she's ashamed, but because she's worried that if her son sees her on television, he will break the little contact she still has with him. Her son has been in Syria for almost a year. Chantal says at first she thought he went to do humanitarian work. But in April, Belgian television showed a clip of her son with rebels announcing plans to plant the Sharia flag in Syria. She thinks her son won't come back. She blames radical groups. She blames her divorce. She blames the government, but especially she blames herself. My son wasn't someone who was bad, quite the opposite, he helped the poor. He had a good heart because sometimes he told me he'd distribute food to the young, to the homeless, with his friends. Me, I was happy because I said this is a good deed, but it was the hidden face of radicalization in his leaving for Syria. While parents question how their children became radicalized, they are also asking how to bring them home. For the mayor of Antwerp, one solution has been to block social benefits for those who've gone to Syria to fight alongside Al-Qaeda-linked rebels. I have already had 33 people uh, stricken from the public records. They are no longer citizens. They can have no social rights. And when they come back, if they should come back, of course they can go nowhere. They have to report themselves and at that moment we can arrest them and uh, interrogate them about what they have done in Syria because we are well informed about what they are doing there. But for the parents, isolating those who want to come back is not the solution. Dimitri Bontik is confident he will bring his son home soon and get some answers. In this situation, not only me, but all the parents uh, from who the youngsters are in Syria, you are thinking, did I fail as a father? Did we fail as parents? Uh, did we do something wrong? You have many questions, you know, and until today, nobody have an answer on that. And for Samira, her questions are in a letter which she hopes someday her daughter will read. We're sick with worry about your being gone, my daughter, my Nora. Come back to us, come home. May God protect you and help us. We're waiting for you and we'll never stop. Our life, my life, stopped on the 20th of May. I love you.